So, hey, my name is Z. I work for Beta NYC, and uh, I would like to thank um, Aiden for being a part of Open Data Week. Um, this session is a crash course uh, in Pandas, which is an awesome Python library um, that does uh, a lot of, well, that, that helps a lot in data analytics and, and data science. Um, this event is a part of a larger festival co-organized by the New York City Open Data Program um, team and Beta NYC, and also Data Through Design, an art collective celebrating in many ways New Yorkers engage with uh, free and public data. Um, I would like to thank um, Aiden for um, spending his time uh, creating this notebook and building out this presentation. So y'all will have a crash course in uh, Pandas. So I'll hand it off to Aiden. All right, thanks so much, Z. Um, so you'll want to open up the notebook uh, that he shared in there. Uh, Z, if you would mind sharing it again in like a few minutes in case we have latecomers, that would be great. Um, yeah, and you can follow along there and then we'll actually do some, some hands-on interactive stuff there. So this workshop is uh, data analysis in Python, and we're going to be using Pandas specifically. There are various tools that you can use to work with data in, in Python, but Pandas is one that um, works really nicely for tabular data. So data looks like a spreadsheet, basically. And um, yeah, it's like relatively easy to get started and um, does a lot of things that you know you'd want you'd want to do. Uh, we'll talk more about what those might be. So I'm Aiden Feldman. I am a civic technologist. I uh, This class is a condensed version of um, a Python coding for public policy class I teach at NYU. And uh, yeah, I've been working in government the past seven years, and now I'm freelancing, working with like nonprofits and uh, still with government teams. And uh, yeah, my background is more as a web developer, uh, then got into sort of cloud and infrastructure and security and that kind of thing, as well as engineering management and uh, yeah, a bit of data, data engineering as well. Okay, so if you are on a government network, you might not be able to access the notebook. I'm really sorry if that's the case. You might be able to access the notebook, but you might not be able to like save a copy in your Google Drive. Also sorry if that's the case. Um, I'll talk more about different options uh, in a little bit, but you may, if you're not able to participate, you know, apologize, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll always be able to, to see what's going on uh, by just watching me do things on the screen. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, this is a condensed version from from that uh, class I teach to public policy students. Um, I'm going to go uh, pretty fast, so please like drop in chat. And Zio will interrupt me uh, with any questions, um, or uh, we should have time at the end. The goal is not for you to totally understand what's going on. I just want like what you're apt at. I just want to give you a sense of like what's possible. And then you can always go back and look at this notebook later to understand how to apply those things. Um, and you know, there's links to documentation and that kind of thing. Um, I encourage you to turn your cameras on if you're comfortable. It's more fun than talking to a wall. Uh, so yeah, if you are if you're game to do that, we'd love to see some more pretty faces. Okay, so let's get into it. So I want to go over some terminology. Uh, so when I throw things around, you have a sense of, of what it's referring to. So Python is a programming language. Um, other programming languages that are popular are JavaScript, Ruby, uh, C++, Objective C. There's a lot of them. Um, R is another programming language that's uh, very commonly used for data analysis. We're doing essentially equivalent things that you would do in R, but using Python. So a package is a sort of bundle of Python code that you can think of like an add-on or, or a plugin. And this is how you kind of like share reusable uh, bits of code between people on your team or, or uh, more often like sharing with strangers. And so that's how you sort of consume like these reusable bits. Pandas is a particular package and that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. And that's used for data analysis. It is mirrored, um, you know, it's sort of meant to replicate what uh, was done in R. So again, working with sort of tabular data formats, uh, if you can do things in R, you can probably do it in Pandas. Um, we're also gonna use another package called Plotly, uh, which is, 
uh, used for data visualization. Um, so it's all the like language stuff. In this environment, um, we're going to be using Jupyter. So Jupyter is, think, think of it like a code editor, but combined with a Google Doc. So you can, or a Word Doc. So you can have sort of like richly formatted um, text and images and all that, uh, but then code and output from that code actually like executable within that document. So it's this really interesting environment. I definitely encourage you playing around with it if you have to have data that shows you know things to other people, which basically anyone who works with data does. So it can run Python, and so we're we're using it for, but it can also support a bunch of other languages. So the individual Jupyter files are called notebooks, and uh, they support Markdown for for that text formatting, and then you can execute code snippets. And it's broken up into chunks, which are called cells. So those are like the individual blocks, which are either text or code. Um, the Jupyter can run a lot of places. You can run it from your machine, um, or you can use a cloud-hosted version. Um, and so we're going to do the latter using a free environment called Google Colab. Uh, so that link uh, that sent, that uh, you should go ahead and open uh, is is a Google Colab environment, but it's it's running notebooks, and that notebook could run other places. Um, Markdown is kind of like a simple HTML. It's a way to like format text using text. So you don't have to have like a fancy ed a fancy uh, editor or anything like that. Um, and then lastly, uh, when we're working with Python, uh, or ex excuse me, when we're working with pandas, we're representing data in this structure called a data frame. So that is the, the sort of equivalent of like a spreadsheet or like a single table. Um, any questions so far? Z, how are we doing? No questions yet. Okay. Anyone have anything? I would encourage you to, you know, speak up the, uh, or like don't be shy about asking questions. I guarantee you, if you're confused about something, someone else is as well. Okay, we have two questions. Uh, can you, okay, you I have to drop Great. the link. Um, okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, so with Colab, we know, do we no longer need Anaconda or IPython to launch Jupyter? Correct. It's more limited uh, than Anaconda. So uh, Anaconda is, there might be a cloud host version, but usually like you're, you're downloading up to your computer. Um, Anaconda is going to be more flexible. You can like install more stuff. Uh, you can load data from your computer more easily. These kinds of things. Colab, um, I would say Colab is good for like smaller projects. Um, but it is very handy that you can, you know, just send a link to people and that kind of thing. But yes, it is. At its core, it's just a different place to run Jupyter Notebooks, and it comes with a bunch of stuff installed. The stuff, meaning uh, Python packages. So Visual Studio Code actually has a built-in um, notebook environment. So that's another good option if you're if you're running things locally. Yeah, Conda is nice because it, or Anaconda rather, uh, because it is a more full-featured editor and has um, makes it really easy to install things and stuff. So if you want to run locally, Anaconda is like a good option. Other questions? All right. So Jupyter notebooks are magical. Um, this presentation itself is a notebook. I mean, you'll see you'll see all this content in the um, you know, in, in the link that was sent. But with a plugin, you basically can select uh, that each cell should be a slide or a sub slide or be hidden or whatever, and then it, you click a button and it turns into a presentation. So it just does amazing things, and I'm very obsessed with it. Um, Pandas, uh, like notebooks that can run in a lot of different places, pandas can run in a normal Python script or anywhere else you can run Python. Uh, but Jupyter does make things easier. It does uh, like rich output, which we'll see in a second. If you're, uh, you know, if you've seen like any hacker movies or you've uh, touched it yourself, the command line right, is a place that you can execute code and things have to be output in, you know, sort of plain text characters. Notebooks, by comparison, on the right, allow you to do graphics and things like that. Um, so it, it is just a much more rich environment for uh, having data you know, show up in, in pleasing ways. And because you can also mix it with text, you can essentially have you know, well-documented code. And even some people uh, 
you know, some, some researchers even use Jupyter notebooks to like write papers, right? And they actually have, have, have code in there to, you know, demonstrate whatever, um, whatever they're doing. So really, really cool environment. Can't uh, recommend it strongly enough. So I mentioned spreadsheets a couple of times. It's, you know, something that most people are familiar with. Uh, and so it's a good sort of jumping off point for, for understanding a lot of these concepts. Um, and so you might ask, like, why, why would I use pandas versus doing something in spreadsheets? Well, spreadsheets are actually great. And I'm not going to try and talk anyone out of using them. The easy stuff is easy, right? Sorting, filtering, viewing data, loading data, like all that stuff is, is very uh, trivial. So lots of people just know how to use it. You can point, click, and scroll, and, and do a lot of uh, you know, the things you need to do. Um, and data and logic also live together as one. So if you put together a formula that um, you know, computes some value based on other things, you can just save the spreadsheet and send that file. And when someone else opens it, or send the Google Doc link or the Google spreadsheet link or what have you, right? Like it, it just shows up for the other person. With code and with pandas, um, the data and logic don't live together. You have a source code file that loads data and transforms data, maybe does output of the data, but usually the data lives somewhere else. So that can be a good thing. That can be a, a bad thing um, in that the code can be more reusable. Um, you can work with larger, larger data sets and things like that. Uh, but you know, you do have to have both of those things where a spreadsheet it all just like is in one file. Uh, pandas and programming languages are also nice because they're more powerful, flexible, and expressive than what you can do in a spreadsheet formula. So you'll see spreadsheet formulas get kind of, compl kind of complicated and crammed into one line. And it's hard to follow what's going on because they're nested and all these cell references don't describe what the thing is that they're, that they're referencing. So formulas you know are good for simple things but get uh you know not very friendly to use uh, after a little while so looking at the two side by side um spreadsheets you know again make the easy things easy loading data viewing data filtering data with pandas you have to know how to code a bit and you have to you know write write a few lines and look at the configuration options and stuff like that right there's no point in pointing and clicking you know, there is, however, once you start getting into manipulating data, a sort of inflection point where, okay, like figuring out the, the right incantation of a spreadsheet formula is basically coding at that point. And so using pandas, you can like make it nicer by, you know, having things on multiple lines and having variable names that are descriptive and that kind of thing. And then, you know, once you start getting the more complicated operations, like joining data across tables, yeah, you can do VLOOKUPs and things, but it's it's a bit limited um, uh, and hard to like troubleshoot and that kind of thing. Pandas, like there's a built-in way to do that and it's very configurable and that kind of thing. Um, any like custom logic, you have to get into scripting. So at that point you're coding anyway. So what's the difference? Uh, pandas, again, this is all like you know, part of the part of the package and it, it makes it easy to do these kinds of things. You can um, also automate things with with pandas so you can have a python script that like runs nightly for example with spreadsheets you you have to have the spreadsheet open and you have to have like a person loading data into it and that kind of thing you can't use it as part of part of an automated operation um, similarly like making things reusable maybe you put together a complex formula in a spreadsheet but it really just lives in that cell you have to like copy and paste it other places. So if you end up like t tweaking it, like doing bug fixes, that doesn't carry with it. You know, if you have uh, source code files, you can sort of load them from different places and have those, uh, right? Like have, have code defined one place and then use multiple. Uh, and then there are also hard limits on uh, large data sets where spreadsheets will you know, crap out after uh, one or five million rows, uh, but probably even before that, depending on your machine. So now we get to actually try something. So go ahead and again, open that link uh, to Google Colab. Um, 
You can save your own copy uh, if you would like one. And then you're going to paste in the, the following example where it says your code here. It's going down to the try it here. So take, take that code, copy it into this cell, double click, and it becomes editable where it says your code here. Paste it in and press play. Can I ask a question? Do we copy the code uh, in, a, in a space where we say like code? There is a plus sign code. I don't think I, I was ever in Collapse, so it's my first time. Yep. So, um, so remember I mentioned like things are split into cells. Mm -hmm. So this this whole like try it area is one cell. Like if you if you click it, oops. Uh, you know if you click in here, you can see it's sort of highlighted. It's a little hard mm -hmm. to see in the dark, dark mode, but like a box there's a box around it. So this is a text cell, uh, and then this is a code cell. So mm -hmm. we are. I, I created a code cell here that you can use, but you can also add a new one by. by uh -huh. I see. I see. You already created the, the spaces. I see. That's right. But it doesn't matter. You can use new one, use the existing one. Okay. Looks like a good handful of folks are able to get it going. Um, so I'll, I'll just talk about it while we're, while we're waiting for the other people to, uh, uh, to do it. So first of all, Collab has a built-in, we're using this uh, package called Plotly for, for visualization. Um, and we're using Plotly because Pandas has built-in chart, charting capabilities, but Plotly is uh, just fancier. It makes interactive charts, which is nice. So what you should see um, is an interactive chart. So I could have run that myself. So um, what's going on in the code here is that we have uh, this upgrade command running first. So we're just up upgrading a package that is available in Collab, but it's just out of date. Um, we're loading that package. This line loads um, sample data. So Plotly comes with comes with some sample data sets. So this is called their like tips data set, like restaurant tips. Um, and then with Plotly, you say, okay, I want a scatter plot. So the scatter plot, you can hover over it and see it has a bunch of options. And you know, we can go to the web page to look at the documentation. But basically, you're just passing the data frame. Again, the data frame is the like the the pandas representation of that like table. Um, you specify what you want on the x-axis. So this is the column name total bill. You specify what you want on the y-axis, which is tip. Uh, and then you specify, in this case, we want a trend line, uh, which is the like, order of least squares trend line. So, so that's just this option OLS. Uh, you, you create this figure and then you tell Jupyter to show it. Um, we can also look. So yeah, we get this, this nice chart. And because um, Plotly is magic, you, know, you can hover over and see like all the different values. Uh, you can zoom in. You can export an image, like very fancy. Um, to also show you uh, with Jupyter, anything, um, whatever is the last line of the cell is what's displayed. So I can say like one plus two is three. Uh, and then I can also just say like DF for that data frame and it will display the table, All right? So, so you'll see these like short, uh, chunks of code. And the last line is just meant to sort of just help with uh, you know, troubleshooting, making sure that you get out what you're expecting. There's a question in the chat. Does Plotly right. produce embedded codes to embed this chart elsewhere? Um, I think, I don't think you can embed it directly. I think your best bet is just to download a PNG, which is like this icon here. I think there is a way to do it, but you like have to use their hosted service or something. So yeah, it is available in the notebook directly. I don't think you can get a URL for the chart produced there, but you can just download an image. Uh, or I, th I think Plotly does have a product called like Dash that you can actually have like hosted versions. And then another question from Lucy, uh, would appreciate any um, opinions on why you use pandas instead of R? Yes. Can step to the end or do you want to? Let's up? do that at the end. I I think I have a slide about that, but um, maybe that's in my class. I'm not sure. Uh, let's come back to that. Remind me. Uh, anything else right now? Yeah. Can I pop in and ask a question? 
Sure. Um, so with Jupyter Notebooks, uh, would you use that only for data analysis in Python or is that just like across the board, do you use that as your environment? Like what's the difference between that and using say PyCharm or VS Code? Yes. So, um, so Jupyter Notebooks are a specific type of file, whereas uh, Colab is like the editor, right? So it's it's more it's actually more the 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 more accurate like apples to apples comparison is like Colab to PyCharm. Uh, PyCharm you can open notebooks. I don't know that it. I, I'm not sure what a uh, PyCharm is like. Uh, notebook support is but like in visual studio code for example if you open a notebook file they actually have a like you know rich editor that looks a lot like colab um i can show that at the end maybe but it, it, you know you, you can basically do the same things uh so yeah it's so the, the apples to apples comparison is like pycharm to colab or, or vs code and then like it would be like notebooks instead of like a python file does that make sense so it's the type of file you're working on versus like where you're working on. Uh, I didn't see who asked the question, but does that answer it? Oh yeah, thanks Aiden, that makes sense. Cool. So yeah, it, you, Jupyter, again, the difference between a Jupyter notebook and a Python file is that it supports text, uh, it supports rich formatting, it outputs within the notebook, it saves the state of that output and you can sort of have metadata and stuff. Uh, for things like you know the slide plugin uh, that I have in there, so it does more than a uh, than a Python file. I'd say generally, if you're like writing reusable code or code that's like meant to be part of a web app or something like that, you'll use a Python file if the code is meant to be kind of directly interactive, which is generally data work. I mean, I guess there could be other things that you're um, that you're that you're using interactive code for. The notebook is a as a nice nice solution, but you can also convert a notebook to a Python file, like even in Colab, I think. Yeah, there's like download.py. And so it just pulls out all the Python code and spits it into a Python file. Cool. I'm gonna keep going. Um, so with Jupyter, you run a cell by either pressing that play button or their keyboard shortcuts. Um, one thing that is a little strange, uh, if you're used to uh, like if you've done coding before, is that cells don't run unless you tell them to. So it saves the output. So when you reopen a notebook, you see what was run and saved last time. But that doesn't mean that like those variables are defined. So the thing that I usually do is when I open a notebook, I'll go to like runtime, uh, restart and run all. So restart like wipes the slate. It you know gets rid of any variables that are defined and that kind of thing, and then runs it top to bottom. So you can run it out of order, like by pressing the play button or using keyboard shortcuts on cells individually, but it's good practice to have it sort of like work cleanly from top to bottom. So uh, yeah, as I mentioned, the last thing in the code cell is what gets displayed uh, when that cell is run, as we see with like the figure being shown here. Uh, and as we see with you know, these two uh, samples that are stuck in there. And then, yeah, it doesn't mean the run, just because you're seeing output doesn't mean the cells can run that session. So again, it's just good practice to like restart and run all. So notebooks do have state, right? They, when you run a cell, that variable gets defined. And if you run them out of order, it might not act the way that it looks like it should. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're working with notebooks. All right, uh, so getting into um, some open data week relevant data. Uh, we're going to look at information on community districts. So community districts are, uh, for those who aren't familiar, are basically neighborhoods, uh, the, the political boundaries in New York City um, that have, uh, you know, appointed officials and, and uh, volunteers uh, on them, but they do things like, uh, like liquor licenses and that kind of thing. Um, we will use a uh, three-on-one data set, which is uh, information about the community districts, uh, specifically the populations. So we see the it has uh, the borough name, the community district number, uh, and so they're they're numbered starting from one for every borough. So there's like the Bronx uh, community district one, Brooklyn community district one, Brooklyn community district two, et cetera. 
and the names just correspond to like kind of the neighborhoods within them. And then this table also has the the populations uh, for the last uh, for the census, you know, 1970 to 2010. So to actually run this, um, we are going to import pandas. So this is loading loading this this package, this plugin, and then we're using the read CSV function. So read CSV can either pull from a local file. In this case, it actually can pull from a URL, which is directly from the the open data site. So this is nice. We don't even have to download anything. Um, we read that. How into, would you get the URL? Uh, yes. So um, if you go to export, let's see if I can remember this. I think if you do export and then like copy this CSV URL, it's kind of small on the bottom left of my screen, but I think that's where I got it from. I think you can also pass in query parameters to filter. Um, if it's a large data set, that's not a great option. I, if it's a large data set, I suggest downloading it and then loading it from you know, your computer or whatever. Uh, you can load it directly from here. There's also um, a package called SodaPy, drop this link, um, that you can use for loading directly from. Uh, Socrata, which is what the open data site runs on, New York City open data site. So this allows you to say like, you know, load from, uh, what is it, open uh, data.cityofnewyork.us. You can pass in a token. If you register for a token, I'll get you greater uh, like rate limit. And then you can say, um, you know, get this data set identifier, which is uh, found in the URL up there here and then uh you know you can pass in options of their like query language like limit to or you know with conditions or that kind of thing so if it's a small data set or if you're only loading a small subset of data this is a good option um for anything large i suggest just downloading it but anyway this is a pretty small small table i uh, can actually see in the output here that it is uh, 59 rows, right? So this data frame, it gets nicely formatted and it's scrollable and it has a comparable, you know, row highlighting. And, you know, it's just a nice experience uh, working in Jupyter uh, that you wouldn't get with you know, just outputting to a terminal, for example. So pandas can read and write directly to or from CSVs. You can talk to SQL databases, you can talk to Excel files, Stata files, I think, like a, a bunch more stuff. So there's documentation uh, on all of that. That's very flexible. So now that we have this data, um, let's do something with it. So uh, yeah, this is a small data set, so this isn't going to be as impressive, but you, you can imagine working with large, large data that um, maybe doesn't fit in the spreadsheet. So you might ask, like, what's the largest community district? Well, we're going to use uh, a method on that data frame, sort values. And we pass in a column name, and we say we want ascending false, so we want uh, the highest first. So in uh, for 2010, the largest population is the uh, Queens Community District 7, which is Flushing, and that had you know, 247,000 people. So um, now you are going to try, uh, find out what community districts had the smallest population in 1980. So again, you will just drop your code in, in your code here section. Um, reminder that just because you're seeing this output here doesn't mean this has been run. So you might need to go back and re-execute those cells or just do you know run time, run all. So while this is happening, I kind of answered it in the chat, but uh, what would you consider uh, too large and should be downloaded? Uh, say 10,000 rows arbitrarily. Yeah. Yeah, I said 100,000, um, but yeah, maybe 10,000 is maybe too Yeah, it, there's a rate, so there's a rate limit. Um, I think if you sign up for a token, that raises the rate limit, but also then you have like, a, you know, a, a token that's saved in your notebook, which, you know, is sensitive to a degree. So like, you don't necessarily want to like pass that around. So, um, you know, also like if you're loading from the canonical data source, that data will could potentially change, right? Like records can go back and get updated. Um, that may be a good thing, that may be a bad thing, right? Because it'll potentially change your analysis every time you run it. 
So downloading also kind of like freezes it in time, which could be desirable. So yeah, it's also it's it's also gonna be slower than like loading from a CSV file locally. But you can just try it. You can just try loading it, and if it doesn't work, then, <laughs> then download it. Or you can have like a separate script that loads from from SodaPy and just uh, you know drops it into a CSV file. So if you do want to update it, you can just run the script again. That's the way to do it too. It's sort of like freezing the artifact. Okay. So again, uh, just drop just doing a thumbs up reaction or drop in chat uh, if you got this working. If you're able to figure out what has the smallest population, which community district has the smallest population in 1980. In a minute or two. Okay. So uh, Lillian, you said uh, you ran DF sort values 1980 population. Uh, what was the error you got? Uh, key error trace value. Hmm. Okay. Said, and at the bottom it says key error and then the 1980 population. Okay. Um, so usually a key error means that you are trying to access a cell, uh, or I'm sorry, a column uh, that doesn't exist. It does look like you spelled it right and everything. Um, like, you know, if you have a typo or something, that can be a problem sometimes. Um, I'm not sure. That's interesting. Um, might need to. Yeah, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure why that wouldn't uh, be working for you. I didn't run all the cells first, so let me try. Okay. That. All right. Yeah, I would expect a different error for that, but anyway. Um, yeah, if you like, if you get like a, you know, name error, DF two is not defined. That usually means that that's usually a good hint that like it doesn't know what that variable is, and so you have to make sure to define the variable by by running cells above. Anyway, um, so for those who weren't able to run this themselves, uh, here we sorted the values by the 2010 population descending. So we just want to, uh, this time, say ascending true, uh, which is the default value, I believe. And we're going to look at the 1980 population. Oh, interesting. Why is that? Let's see. OK. so. I'm not going to show you how I would troubleshoot something like this. So again, it's going to output uh, from this last last line. So I might do other things to inspect. Here I'm going to say um, df dot columns, and that will tell me what the variables are. Okay, so this is interesting. The those column names are not the column names up here. So that means that that variable uh, df got redefined somewhere. So that means I should name my variables better because everything being called DDF, it's confusing what it's referred to. So um, I'm just going to rerun these particular cells and worry about like cleaning this up later. So I'm run that, run that, run that, run that. OK, that sorting works. And now let's try that in this guy again. Great, that works. OK, so just to recap what happened, it was giving a key error because it was finding a column that didn't exist. The reason it couldn't find that column is because it was trying to operate on a data frame that is different than the one we expected. So good example of name your variables, something more descriptive than DF. <laughs> so you don't have uh, conflicts like this. So I'm going to add a to do to fix that for myself. Um, all right. So, so great. So that's a good example of, of uh, best practice here. All right, uh, so now um, we can do slightly more interesting uh, calculations, right? Sorting, something we could do in a spreadsheet, not that exciting. Um, the uh, really powerful uh, feature in Pandas is grouping and aggregates. So here we can tell it a column or multiple columns to group. So we want all of the boroughs together. Or everything with the same like borough name together, and then we tell it what to do with it. So for each column, give us the sum. So we sort of chain chain those two operations together with the group by and the sum here, um, and saving that as a new data frame. And so now each cell is the sum of all the rows that had that same borough name. You know, in uh, 1970, the Bronx. This means the Bronx across all of its community districts had uh, you know 1. 1.5 1.47 million people. Right, is that right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this now gives populations 
uh, by borough by year. We do have this community district column number, and because it was numeric, it did get summed up, but it doesn't really make sense to have the sum of the community district's numbers. So maybe we want to clean that up. Let's see, I have a note here, don't call things DF. So it summed all the numeric columns, but CD doesn't really make sense. Uh, so we want to get rid of that. So we can use like drop is how you delete columns um, or rows for that matter. Um, and so now this you know, table looks a little better. So something else to know about pandas is that most operations are like return a copy. So it's not going to modify the original data frame. So you want to like save it, either overwrite that variable or um, my suggestion is like save it to a new variable to uh, you know to to continue working with because then you can it's like easy to go backwards and, and you know kind of troubleshoot. So you know, I might say like you know pop by borough clean or something like that. Okay, so another calculation we might want to do is like how the how the populations change over time. Again, we're not dealing with a huge amount of data here, but you can imagine uh, if you had a lot more rows. So here, another helpful built-in function is percent change. So we tell it to move across the columns. And so what it's going to do is look from, you know, go from left to right. And each column, it's going to compute the difference from the previous one. So the 1970 column, you can ignore that because it's just looking relative to the community district number, which again, doesn't really make sense. So we're just looking from 1980, right? So here, this is saying in, um, in 1980, the Bronx population decreased by 20% relative to 1970, right? The, uh, you know, from, 20, from 2000 to 2010, Staten Island uh, population increased 5%. So uh, again, you can do this with a spreadsheet, but you have to like drag formulas and stuff. It's a little, a little annoying. Okay, so those were some kind of like aggregate uh, transformations that you're like working across uh, entire columns and things. Uh, now let's get into some uh, other interesting stuff in terms of visualization. Here we're gonna use uh, different open data, which is the, um, the community district boundaries. So this is a geospatial data set that gives you know, all the uh, polygons that, that make the different community district outlines. And you can see when I click on the map here, um, you know, it gives some information about, about those community districts. Uh, so there's a question about the previous um, the, the previous sure. example. Um, yeah. For percent change, do the columns have to be in the correct order left to right? What would we do if they aren't in the correct order? Um, you can reorder them. Um, so the, the answer is yes, by default. It's probably configurable. I've never, I don't know that I've tried. Um, yeah, I think it is expecting them to be in the correct order. There might be a way to override it. So I would just reorder the columns. Uh, and I don't remember the method name to do that, but, but it's, it's, you know, a one liner. More often you'd probably be doing this by row anyway. So you, you know, sort by some, by like date or something like that, and then do the percent change that way. Okay. So mapping. So the this data set, um, which we can see as uh, specified as a GeoJSON file. Um, so if you aren't familiar with GeoJSON, it's just a way to it's a standardized format for uh, representing geospatial data. So uh, here it's talking about the views. Um, so don't look at that. This is jumping ahead. Um, but a GeoJSON, okay, well, I'll, I'll pull it up in a second. But anyway, GeoJSON um, essentially gives a bunch of points uh, for these different features that um, display the, you know, that, that correspond to each shape, in this case, community district, uh, and then I kind of properties. So what we saw when we clicked on, um, on the community districts here is that there's a property called borough underscore CD. So this is the, uh, the borough code uh, is what I call it. Um, and that's a three digit number corresponding to the community district. So that is a thing that is derived where there's a, the first number, the first digit is corresponding to the 
um, borough, right? So one is Manhattan, two is the Bronx, et cetera. And then the, the second and third digit are the community district number. So 407 is the Queens seventh community district, right? Manhattan Upper East Side is 108, Manhattan community district eight. So it's it's a way to sort of like standardize and like you know, have like shorthand for representing community districts. But we don't have that in our data set, right? If we went back and look at it, it is um, there's they're split up as like the, the the borough name and then the community district as a numeric value. So we can write a function that that uh, uh, you know puts that together for us. So what we're doing here is saying uh, take this take take this function and apply it across all the rows. Axis one means you know go go uh, across the rows. You could also apply across columns if you wanted. So this function is executed for every single row and it checks, okay, if the borough is Manhattan, the borough, you know, start with 100. So one is the like first digit and then add the community district number and then turn that into a string. So this is just a way to like derive that three digit number. So when we do that, we can see uh, the output here where originally, and I'm just outputting a subset of the columns, right? So I'm taking that data frame and then passing in a list of the column names that I want to see. So Bronx one, the borough code that's derived is 201. So we need that because we need to match it up to the map because uh, this doesn't actually like say the borough name, it just has that, that numeric borough code. So here we're going to take that GeoJSON uh, data as a URL. We're going to um, pass in our original source data, I'll make this bigger. Um, to this core plus map box uh, method. So, so core plus are these, are these maps where the different political boundaries are like a different color just correspond to the values. You see them all the time for election maps and that kind of thing. Those are called core plus maps. So uh, Plotly can do core plus maps where you pass in a data frame, you tell it where to get the GeoJSON. Um, you tell it what the, in your data frame, what the column name is to do the matching on. And then the feature ID key is from the GeoJSON, what should that correspond to? Um, so in this case, they're both borough code, borough CD. Um, for the values, we're specifying, okay, we want this, this uh, 2010 population column to be the, the thing that you know, determines the, uh, the color, and it automatically figures out the colors and everything for us. Um, when we hover over the community district, we wants to show the community district name. And so that's helpful. Uh, and then, you know, this is what the center of the map should be. This is the sort of zoom level. And then the map box style is like the color scheme that we want. Um, but this is not very much code. And we have this really nice looking interactive map. Uh, so like yet another example of, um, you know, just cool things you can do with like very little code in, uh, in pandas and, and Jupyter. So uh, I'd like to some pandas resources there if you're interested in learning more. Um, and that is all the material I had. So we can take the last five minutes for questions. I have a question. Sure. So in your code box number 16, when you created a column borrow underscore CD, mm -hmm. right? And that you created that and that just become, that's a permanent part of the data frame now? Well, so we modified the data frame, but that doesn't like save it back to the CSV or anything. So it's just, yeah, it's that, uh, yeah, we are modifying the data frame. Um, so okay. we take the DF and then in square brackets, you give a column name and then assign stuff to it. So yeah, here's where we're creating a new column, but it's just modifying the data frame, not like whatever data source it came from. Okay. So it's basically permanent for this. Column. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There's a question in the chat about uh, the chloroplast map code. Um, can you explain a bit more about the feature ID key? Yep. So the the you have a data set and you have your geospatial information, and you have to tell it how to like match those, right? It's like if you're doing like a join across tables, it's like the equivalent thing, but for a table and 
and a map essentially. So what, how do, how do you, how do you make those align? So that's where those two properties come in. Locations is like what column name should be used. And here they happen to look the same, but like if we had, you know, uh, right, we could call it something else. Like maybe our data, maybe our data just uh, came with this, right? Um, so now that's like a borough code all in caps. Here we'll change the column name to be borough code. But the GeoJSON that we're receiving, the properties under here, let me see if I can get this to display. Downloading. If you just download the file and then probably drag it into like geojson.io, folks can see it. Mm, good idea. Okay. Uh, uh, open. I've not used this before. This is cool. Uh, oh, wait, there you go. Uh, yeah, this is great. It's very good to know. Um, so yes, anyway, this is what the GeoJSON looks like. So basically there's this big features uh, list that um, each one of those is like a shape. It could be you know, another GeoJSON, like it's a road or it's a point or whatever, but in this case, it's, it's like the shapes. So you have all these coordinates, um, but the properties, properties dot borough code is essentially what we're referencing. So like 206 is the Bronx. Six community, uh, community district six. So that's what we're doing. So answer your question. Cool. Great. Uh, is there uh, what's the best way to see all the defined variables um, slash data frames in Jupyter Notebook? Uh, that's a good question. I think Colab has this variables tab. Yeah. So if you on the left, uh, it, it's something that's like kind of built into the editors. Uh, I don't. There's there's not like a super clean way to do it from like within a cell, for example, but yeah, the depending on your editor, like collab or whatever, like they'll usually have something for that. Yeah, I think defaultly Jupyter Notebook doesn't have it, but you have the newer version of Jupyter Lab, you will have access to something similar. Yeah. And then Spider, more advanced version. Yeah. 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 Um, another question is uh, can the geographic coordinate system be specified in pandas or are lat long uh, coordinates required for pandas to map? Uh, pandas doesn't know what lat long coordinates are. Uh, they're just numbers. So um, I think it's more about the mapping tool, knowing what to do with those. Uh, there is a there is a um, what's it called geo pandas. So so pandas doesn't know anything about like geospatial things. Um, there is a tool called geo pandas that like will allow you to do you know. Geospatial stuff that I don't know too much about. It's not, not really my, not really my bag. Yeah, the, you can practically do all the all the functions in that, that you normally do, like the simple ones intersect. Uh, you can select by things that intersect with other things. There's all polygons. It's very useful. Um, and then yeah. also you can co uh, convert coordinate systems. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, another question is, what's the best way to get data if you need to work with uh, three million rows? Yeah, so I would just download your computer would be the easiest way. Um, you know, if you have a centralized database that you can access, you can do that from, depending on your organization's security, like you can, uh, yeah, locally is going to be the fastest or unless, it, unless you have like a, a sort of centralized environment that your organization offers. But I would just download a CSV or, or whatever to your computer and do it there. So similar to spreadsheets, um, R is great if you're looking at it, but if you need to have like tasks that run in the background, R probably is not a is not necessarily a great choice. Um, you know, Python you can sort of like run on a server somewhere, um, and because the yeah because that is um, yeah there, there are a lot of tools for like there are a lot of ways to like execute execute Python in that sense. Um, it's gonna be a lot, a lot better there. Um, R uh, has a lot more of this, like you know, R sort of comes in with com comes uh, pre-built with like all the uh, like data frames and all of that. Pandas, you have to like install that package. So you know, maybe that is if installing stuff's a pain for you. Like that might be easier. Um, what else? Python is. You can do Python as a general purpose language. 
So whereas R is like specifically useful for data analysis, Python, you can use it for data analysis and a bunch of other stuff. So like building web applications. And so that means you can also like mix it in, right? So you could theoretically like use pandas as part of a web application um, if you needed to. So, uh, you know, I, I, I really like that aspect of it. Um, yeah, but, you know, R is probably more popular in like academic circles uh, and maybe some organizations. So, you know, they're, they're comparable enough that like, I would definitely recommend like using whatever your organization uses as opposed to like, don't just like switch from R to Python just for the hell of it um, if you're already using one. Um, yeah, so uh, R and Python versus SAS. Um, I don't know that much about SAS, but I used it a little bit and hated it. So I'm not gonna like say anything nice about it, um, but I'm just biased. So R and Python are open source and free. So uh, that is a much lower barrier to entry. Um, you know, there's not a support line you can call, so that's a downside. Um, yeah, but I will not recommend SAS to anybody, <laughs> but there's probably other people that like it. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, R, R and Python are, you know, being open source that like lowers barrier entry and that's like enough of a reason for me. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. So if you want to ask any questions off, off of the recording, um, yeah. All right. Bye internets.